Welcome in to Bears Weekly, a Chicago Bears Network production. Download the Chicago Bears official app, brought to you by Verizon, to follow the team on the go. Bears Weekly is brought to you by Advocate Healthcare, Bet Rivers, CDW, Connie's Pizza, and Miller Lite. Here are your hosts, Jeff Joliak, a.k.a. the Mayor of Bearsville, and his sidekick, Tom the Surfmaster Thayer. Well, I guess I'm just the sidekick sidekick because uh, Jeff Joniak is on vacation. So hope he's having a, a wonderful time up there in uh, Vancouver. So this is Bears Weekly. Jim Miller, Tom Thayer, we'll have you uh, for the next hour getting you set for, for training camp for the Chicago Bears. And this segment of Bears Weekly is brought to you by Atletico Physical Therapy. Visit atletico.com to request an in-clinic or virtual appointment and start feeling better tomorrow. Plenty of news uh, going down around the NFL, Quinn and Williams, defensive tackle of the New York Jets. He agrees uh, to a four-year, $96 million extension. We'll get $66 million uh, guaranteed. Been That places him as the second-highest-paid defensive tackle in the league, just behind uh, Aaron Donald. So you saw the other deals getting done, Jeffrey Simmons, Dexter Lawrence. Obviously, Donald is still the, the king of the hill, but that could certainly be coming to a close pretty quickly as Chris Jones of uh, the – Kansas City Chiefs probably will be the highest paid defensive tackle when it's all said and done when the Kansas City Chiefs ink his deal. And as we roll along, we're going to have some great guests uh, this evening. Jack Sanborn, he will join us about 6.08 p.m. Eastern time. And then we'll have Jason McKee, former Chicago Bears fullback. He'll join us at 6.30. So it'll be good to check in with those players as well. And it's my pleasure to check in with my teammate tonight. So let's uh, bring in Tom Thayer and see how his week is going. Tom, welcome to the program, my friend. How's everything going? Oh, big, big Jim, it's good to talk to you. You know, at least we have a little bit of time to talk now without Joniak in the room, so let's get this. Hey, didn't didn't the, the defensive tackle, wasn't it Hargrave that start, or signed with San Francisco early in the offseason that really got the defensive tackle money rolling? Um, am, am I right on that, or am yeah. I thinking? No, I was, yeah, no, you're exactly right. And then, of course, Deron Payne, and then Jeffrey Simmons. All these deals came after Hargrave, who did get a huge deal to to join the uh, the San Francisco Forty ers And that's that's why I bring up to you. And Quinton Williams is just an incredible player. Yeah. I mean, this guy. Yeah. But Chris Jones, I mean, what defensive tackle in the league is fifteen and a half uh, sacks? I mean. Uh, Deron Payne had 11 and a half last year for the Washington Commanders, but I do believe Chris Jones is going to reset the market. And you're right, Tom. I mean, we've seen the wide receiver market explode last year, and this year it's kind of been this D-tackle market that has exploded as of late. Well, you, you know, Jim, the difficulty of finding uh, greatness at whatever position it may be of that season and I think when there was a couple names in the draft, i.e. Jalen Carter coming aboard, the kid out of Northwestern, a couple of guys that they felt they could come and uh, contribute immediately, then the Bears, they drafted a couple defensive tackles themselves. But the veteran free agents that have a little body of work already on video where these guys can get a break a breakdown of how they would fit into their system. So, hey, I, I, and I know the Bears – Went and, you know, they got Justin Jones. They drafted three defensive tackles. They have the other guys they brought along in free agency. You know, if there was, if you, if, if Ryan Poles could go back to his Kansas City roots and somehow, you know, maybe, you know, talk to a guy like Chris Jones, I wouldn't hate it. It would just be a matter of shifting uh, some of the talent that the Bears have on the defensive line around to, you know, to get the best four defensive linemen on the field for as many snaps as you possibly can. Yeah, and we'll see how it shakes out with these young defensive tackles and if they can carve themselves out uh, some playing time in a rotation as training camp is just around the corner. And, and Tom, I'm, I'm sure you heard the news this week. Obviously, uh, great news is a, a, you know, a teammate of yours, Steve McMichael, and how about Virginia McCaskey among the Hall of Fame uh, semifinalists? Obviously, McMichael played 13 seasons uh, with the Bears. What an integral piece uh, to that 1985 Super Bowl championship defense. All-time sack list as well Come in that 92 and a half just behind uh, your buddy Richard Dent and so congratulations uh, to Steve we all know he's been going through a rough time dealing with uh, ALS but certainly worthy as well as Virginia McCaskey as she is the longest tenured owner uh, in the NFL right now as it sits so congratulations to both of them you know what Jim of everything you said the, the word worthy came to mind because they both deserve it because of their accomplishments this is not something that we're doing because 
Ming is battling AL, ALS, and, you know, he's the most well-admired teammate uh, of that a lot of us have, have ever been around. His work ethic, his work habits, his desire, his dedication, everything that you would want to see uh, the yellow jacket jacket represent, that is Steve McMichael. And with Virginia McCaskey, look, there's no one that has a longer tenure of responsibility in the history of the NFL than Virginia McCaskey. And you think how long she's been around the game, some of the influences that she's had in her life and how many influences she's had around the game of football. Um, yeah, I, I really, I, I wish and I hope for both of these, uh, uh, both of these guys in, in getting in the NFL. But, you know, me personally, because I practice against Steve every day in he brought it every day, and he would tell you, look, I'm going hard today, so you better, you know, put air in your helmet and tape your ankles because that's the way we're going to go to work today. And um, it's, in terms of just the player of Steve McMichael, I admire him so much for everything that he was able to accomplish and everything he did for for the Chicago Bears over his history time. In Misty, his wife has been relentlessly trying to capture the attention of the people that make these decisions in the Hall of Fame because um, I don't know if you got to see when Jared Payton was announcing that he was a candidate for Hall of Fame they had video of it when it brought a big smile to Steve's face and you know um, I think there's a lot of us that would just love to see the not, I'm not saying it's a reward because, like you said, he's worthy of everything he deserves. Definitely worthy. And like you said, two and uh, 29 other finalists as well. Steve is in the, the senior category uh, where he's a semifinalist. And Virginia, Virginia McCaskey is in the contributor uh, category. And like you said, they've got to have a great presenter. Uh, basically, there's a representative that is going to present, have to state the case, and, and hopefully it's presented in the, the right way because it's so important when you get into those rooms because it can become political where those voters say, hey, if you vote my guy in, I'll vote your person in. That type of stuff goes on in, in order to to get people into to where they need to be but have to have a person really banging the table, presenting the case uh, for you in order uh, to become uh, a Hall of Fame uh, member. As we roll on, we're going to get into the comments this week of uh, Braxton Jones starting left tackle for the Chicago Bears uh, saying that Darnell Wright is just a little bit further along uh, at the as a rookie than what he was when he joined the Chicago Bears uh, a season ago. Certainly a fine year. Uh, for uh, Braxton Jones or our areas that he's going to improve upon. But you really, before we go to the first break, and as we'll be joined by Jack Sanborn on the other side, Bears linebacker, just for Darnell Wright and what you've seen, because people think that Tennessee, because he's just a mauler, that they just ran the football. They actually pass the football in that style of offense that the volunteers. To me, his passing uh, pr- pass protection should be pretty decent. Uh, from from Darnell Wright. Well, we'll get into that as we roll along, Tom. You can answer that on the other side. As we should be joined by Jack Sanborn, Chicago Bears linebacker, just getting it started on Bears Weekly. Tom Thayer, Jim Miller, keep it right here on ESPN 1000. This is Bears Weekly with the voice of the Bears for 23 years, Jeff Joniak on the Bears Radio Network. Hey, everyone. Do you want VIP access to every Bears home game, exclusive seating, sideline credentials, and more are now available. Get the ultimate VIP fan package this season by visiting ChicagoBearsVIP.com. And uh, Jim Miller, Tom Thayer with you. And as promised, we are going to go out to the guest line, welcome in our first guest of the evening. Let's say hello to Bears second-year linebacker, Jack Sanborn, to, to Bears Weekly. So, Jack, Jim Miller, Tom Thayer, thank you for giving us a few moments of your day. And really, it was a joy watching you play last year. You get in the, the six starts, 14 games overall. And has everything, I just want to start it out saying, has everything slowed down for you, Jack? You were playing like with your hair on fire when everything was coming at you so quickly. Thanks for giving us a few moments of your night. Yeah, first off, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. And um, to go off your question, you know, I think, uh, I don't know if it, everything slowed down. I think I was just trying to be me. And um, But yeah, very excited. I had him already right now into year two and uh, couldn't be more excited to get going. 
Hey, Jack, wh- when you consider where you're at this year as opposed to last year, last year you come in, you're a free agent. I don't know if you put pressure on yourself or not. But this year you kind of earned a lot of pressure on yourself because of what Jim mentioned. You played with your hair on fire. You are all over the field. How do you feel from a year ago to right now getting ready for training camp? I think it's just confidence. I think it's more confidence. And they always they always say that experience is the best teacher. And, you know, to have that experience, especially especially your first year uh, in the league and, you know, getting snaps, getting meaningful snaps, I think I think that just builds confidence to kind of first you have to show to yourself that you can really do it. And then and then going off of that, then you just try to improve and, you know, you try to get better. You you understand where you can get better. And, you know, that's what the game's all about. The game's all about improving uh, week in and week out. And, um, yeah, so that's what I'm looking forward to doing going into year two. Well, Jack, you showed up in every category. You got a fumble recovery. You got a couple of sacks, tackles for loss. You hit that category, three hits on, on the quarterback. And what specifically, what areas do you feel you've gotten better or even when you went back and watched yourself from year one and said man that that can't happen I, I got to work more on this so what what have you find yourself really honing in on in your mind yeah I think a lot of it is is mental as well just you know understanding more offensive tendencies you know trying to just be a step quicker in some cases and then just getting the ball you know that's what that's what uh coach Flus preaches on all the time especially as a linebacker you know is one be around the ball and two get the ball and uh I think that's one area that I can I can improve on, and one area that, as a defense, we can improve on is just you know causing those game changing plays to ultimately you know give the ball back to the offense, score on it as defense, and you know and all that leads to victories, and you know that's that's the end goal and everything. Hey, you know, Jack, you're born in 2000. Heck, we are done playing by the time you were born. But <laughs> just to kind of analogize our time frame, so I came to the Bears, and I remember my first nine on seven period was going against the A that turned out the 85 defense. You got a Hall of Famers all over the place. In my first couple plays, Jack, I was going, I don't know if I can play the game at this speed. It's it's the fat and then and then you get a couple practices under underneath your belt and then you start saying, okay, I can play this sport, but I have to improve. So from your first nine on seven against the first team to then when you got snaps in the regular season, because I didn't get snaps in the regular season till the third game of the year. So how was that transition from day one of nine on seven in full pads to day one of actual game rep? I mean, huge. And I mean, it's just a lot of it is, is mental. I mean, going into a new scheme, an NFL scheme, you know, you really have to learn a lot. And, you know, you lean on got on older older guys that have kind of been around. And, you know, you also lean on your coaches and everything. And, you know, you never really know until you go out there. I mean, my first start was going against the Dolphins. And, you know, they, obviously they have Tyreek Hill. And it's like we're watching film. And it's like, oh, you know, you're going to have to run with him here or, that, or, or there. And it's like, geez, you know, you're looking at it like this is a lot different than college football and uh, or what I'm used to. And then, um, but, you know, once you get out there, you know, like I said, you, you start building that confidence. And, I mean, so early it's just – kind of play after play, you know, getting a little more comfortable, getting the feel for the game, getting a little more confident. And then, and then, and then you just continue to improve, continue to get better. And, um, you know, that's what I think kind of motivates uh, specifically me just as a player is, you know, seeing it going and doing what I kind of did last year, you know, and really seeing how much I, what I want to improve on where I can improve and, you know, to want to want to be a better player to help this team. Well, you mentioned leaning on older players and, <laughs> You know, Tremaine Edmonds, he's been a green dot ever since he arrived in Buffalo. I remember I did that training camp, and uh, Coach McDermott told me, yeah, he's already calling the plays. He's a green dot. And then you can lean on him. You can lean on T.J. Edwards, uh, certainly. And what have those guys been able to show you in their early stint there as teammates uh, of yours now? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I think everyone's really excited to have him. I know I am. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I was teammates with TJ for a year at Wisconsin, so obviously I'm very familiar with him. Uh, you know, we always kept in touch, you know, even last year and uh, stuff like that. And then uh, just being fortunate to meet uh, Tremaine, being around Tremaine, um, you can tell that, you know, both of them want to win. And I think especially at this stage uh, in their careers, you know, Tremaine's been around, he's done – played really good ball and uh, had a lot of success too, both individually and as a team. And I mean, one thing about him is that he wants to win. And, uh, and, you know, I know the same thing for TJ. TJ was at the big dance last year and, you know, came up short and I know he wants to get back. 
and I know he, you know, both of them kind of have that fire and, um, you know, they want to have team success and they want to win. And I think you can see that very easily right away. And, uh, and yeah, and with that, they have a lot of experience, you know, a, a ton of experience and uh, some two people that I can lean on, two people that I can learn from and, you know, just really understand, you know, how how to go about it, how to be an NFL linebacker week in, week out for, for 18 weeks and, um, you know, play not only play, you know, one one or two games here and there at a high level, but play play for 18 weeks consistently at a high level. You know, I think that's what we're all trying to do and as a, as a unit and, and as a team. Hey, Jack, head equipment uh, manager, Tony Medlin, did he give you 57 or did you ask for that? Because, you know, that was the number I wore, and I believe it has some really good mojo in it. You look at the career that Olin Krutz had and stuff, so I hope you're going to be wearing it again this year. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be wearing it this year. There's a little a little uh, unsure because TJ obviously right, wore 57 right. uh, with the Eagles. But I, I, TJ, I think was kind of being nice to me, and I mean, he did wear fifty three uh, at Wisconsin while we were there together, and uh, he made he made it very easy. I didn't know how he was going to be about it, you know, if he really fell in love with the number over the past four years. But I just told him that I think he looks better in fifty three anyway. So, uh, so yeah, <laughs> yeah, way we, we to po- politically deal with that the correct way. I'm sorry, Tom. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, exactly. go, go ahead, Tom. Well, so so Jack. Uh, I'm sorry to ask about 57. I, like I said, I got a soft spot in my heart. No, it's a good but, number. And, it, it, and when people wear, you know, you see 57s, uh, you know, in the stands or whatever, and I just know that it's probably for you guys, not really for me right now. So uh, I appreciate oh, no. that. Listen, dude, we're going to see, we're going to see Sanborn 57 jerseys in the stands. Hey, so when you go through an, an exit interview after your first year, and I mean, you, you, the expectations for all of us, we didn't know what to expect, but you overwhelm them anyways. So when you went through your exit interview with the, the guys up at Hallis Hall, what did they, did they recommend anything? Did they tell you they would like to, for you to be at this weight or this position or anything? Or how, how was that final interview? I mean, it was kind of a unique scenario and unique case for me because it was kind of my first time back in the, even in the facility in about, at that time was three weeks coming from uh, my ankle injury in week 15 and that. And um, so it was kind of a, a little different uh, interview, just exit interview, just because we all understood what the main goal was. And, you know, the main goal was getting healthy, getting my ankle to a hundred percent. And obviously I didn't do OTAs, didn't do mini camp, just really focused on trying to get that, you know, getting back and getting back to a hundred percent. And, you know, kind of made my off season a little, a little different, you know, not exactly obviously what you want to be going through, but I think at the same time, I think I, you know, I've made the most of it and, uh, you know, trying to get better in other areas, you know, and stuff like that. And, um, yeah, I think, uh, I think, uh, everyone's comfortable. I'm, I'm very comfortable with where I'm at right now. Everyone else, I believe everyone else is too. And, um, yeah, just ready to get, hit the ground running here in, uh, in a week or so. And, um, you know, start, start year two. Yeah, well, where are you? Like you said, a, w- a week away. Are, are you antsy? I mean, uh, what do you, what do you do? Like really, this last week as you get your mind right, because the next six months are are pretty much the grind. You're in it at this point. Yeah, I think that's exactly exactly what you said. I think it's you know get your mind right. You know, I think that's what this obviously do stuff with the body. You know, get little little workouts here and there. Um, really focus on the body. Just making sure that you get, you're going in the camp. But you know, a hundred percent and your best ability. And, um, but like you said, I mean, just get mentally, mentally prepared for, uh, what's to come so, so you can hit the ground running. So through your experience of OTAs and, uh, mandatory mini camp, when you were out on the sidelines, was there anything specifically you were paying attention to, or even when you went to the meetings and you started watching the video of practices and stuff, are you a guy that works your eyes from the defensive line to the linebacker position, or is everything, uh, listen to the terminology called in the huddle and then just watching it from the eyes of the linebacker? Yeah, I, I first off, I like to kind of put my eyes in the eyes of the linebacker. Obviously, you know the call, you get the call, so you can see exactly how, how, how everyone reacts, how they react, you know, are they in the right spot, stuff like that. Because obviously, I mean, Tremaine and TJ come, it's a new scheme for them, you know, they weren't in it last year, so that was kind of their big thing this offseason you know if I was able to help them here and there you know I, I would do my best and um 
And then, uh, but I mean, I think that gave me an opportunity also to just, you know, watch the entire team and, you know, watch even the offense inside the ball and stuff like that. Um, and because, I mean, when you're out there, you're kind of, you know, kind of almost got a little tunnel vision, you know, you're focused on what you're doing, you're focused on kind of what the guys around you are doing, and you don't really get the the opportunity to kind of, you know, sit back and, you know, kind of open up that lens to exactly, you know, what are other positions doing, you know, what's the O-line doing, what, what are the running backs doing, and, you know, kind of, kind of seeing stuff like that, uh, I think it was very interesting, obviously, would have loved to be out there um, more than anything, but I think I was able to make the most of it. Well, I, I know, yeah, obviously the linebackers coach Dave Borgonzi, but, you know, that's Coach Eberflus's position at heart. You know, he played the position. I mean, how much are you, are you getting intel, like whether it's uh, you, whether it's Tremaine, or maybe even prod your coach a little bit because he's coached this style of defense for so long, and he has played the position. He was a really good linebacker, dude. I don't know if you've ever seen video of Eberflus. He was a really good player. No, and he makes sure to tell us too. I mean, he's in our meetings a lot. And, uh, he's sitting, <laughs> us, sitting with us, uh, and he, he'll tell us exactly how he would have done it and uh, stuff like that. But no, he's he's with us a lot. He's always uh, given his points, him him and uh, Borgonzi, and yeah, just two great ass, uh, assets to utilize and you know to learn learn from it. And because, like you said, I mean, both of them from uh, Eberflus to Borgonzi, uh, both of them have coached very good linebackers. I mean, Sean Lee, uh, Shaquille Leonard, just to name a couple. I mean, both have coached uh, really good players and know know what really good linebacker play looks like, and uh, they also expect that. So you obviously work your best to, you know, to do it how they want and, you know, play the best ball that you can. Hey, Jack, being a local guy, do you have a favorite bear of all time? I mean, I – you know, I've, you I can get say nobody there, will get off. offended. We all respect the heck out of you. <laughs> no, and uh, I mean, obviously, you know, growing up around is Devin Hester, Brian Erlacher, all those. But I feel like I always had my unique one, I think, is, you know, I always had a big a big uh, soft spot for Johnny Knox. Loved the way that he, that he played. And, uh, you know, growing up, I always wanted to, you know, everybody wants to be a receiver. Everybody wants to have the ball, you know, score touchdowns. And so really kind of growing up, uh, I think Johnny Knox was the guy that, you know, I, I always liked a lot. Well, uh, yeah, I've got a soft spot since yours is 57. Mine's 15. And every time I see a number 15, I, I know it's not Brandon Marshall. That, that's in, It's me in spirit is, is what people are aware of. So anyway, hey, Jack, have another uh, a great year. Looking forward to seeing you at training camp. And, and hopefully everything just works out everything you, how you want it to be. Thank you. I appreciate it, and thanks for having me on. Thanks, Jack. Jack Sanborn, yeah. and this linebacker group has been overhauled. There is no doubt about that. Uh, you can say that with Tremaine Edmonds coming in, Tom, at the, the middle backer position. You sign T.J. Edwards, who's a tackling machine. You bring over Dylan Cole up from Tennessee. You draft Noah Sewell, fifth rounder out of Oregon, and this is an overhaul, in my opinion. We graded this position during the week. The Bears linebacking core grades out very high heading into 2023. You know, Jim, it's it's kind of crazy because you look at all the different um, grading uh, circuits there are around the NFL, and the Bears uh, linebackers are getting a lot of praise. But, you know, to me, it's still going to be about the performance of the guys up front. And that's why I was interested to hear about Jack and what he paid attention to during his time off and watching film of that. Because when you think of Edmonds and you think of T.J. Edwards and you think of all the guys and the defensive linemen that they played around, there's been so you know they played um, behind some stud defensive lines, and I think that's going to be the key component here. If this defensive line whether you're a young guy that's just come aboard in the rookie class this year or you're a guy like Justin Jones that's been around for a little while now, if they can give these def- these linebackers a little freedom and a little bil- ability to run, they they have the athleticism, they have the coverage speed, they have the, the radius that they can protect downfield. So it's going to be an interesting way that this defense develops because it's definitely going to have to be the defensive line – complimenting the, the linebackers and the linebackers complimenting the defensive line. Yeah, yeah, they affect each other and certainly got to keep them free, like you said, to allow them to be the athletes uh, that they are. And we'll see if there is enough up front because it's going to be about the rotation that uh, Coach Eberflus has talked about and certain guys are tabbed in certain rows or certain uh, uh, ex- 
expectation of whether they're one technique or whether they're a three technique and have to be a penetrator like a, a Justin Jones and have to be a disruptive that will allow these linebackers uh, to make these plays without them. Well, as uh, as we roll along, I do want to get into that conversation that Braxton Jones had about uh, Darnell Wright. Plus, on the other side, we should have a Jason McKee, former fullback uh, for the Chicago Bears, as he's going to join us. He continues to do great things in the community. I believe he's a, a coach there at uh, high yes. school coach there at Carmel. Carmel Mundelein. Yeah, doing a fine job uh, there as well. So let's hit the break here, Tom. When we come back, should have uh, Jason McKee on the other side. So keep it right here. This is Bears Weekly with the voice of the Bears for 23 years, Jeff Joniak on the Bears Radio Network. By CDW, people who get it. Well, you know who also gets it is Jason McKee, the former fullback of the Chicago Bears, as he helped Thomas Jones and just led the path for Thomas Jones to get over 1,200 yards rushing. Also, help uh, Matt Forte uh, to log his most yards as a rookie uh, for the Chicago Bears. And now he's doing great things. He's got the, the moniker of head coach now to his resume as well, so of Carmel High School. So let's go out and welcome in former Bears fullback Jason McKee to Bears. Weekly, uh, Jason, Jim Miller, Tom Thayer, with you. Thanks for giving us a few moments of your night. Thanks for joining us. Uh, of course, guys. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Well, let's let's start there. Now, uh, there's only other word I call. I always call the head coach. I got to call you coach now. So, Coach McKee, <laughs> how, how's it feel with that hat on, buddy? It's good. I'm actually just coming off the practice field. Uh, so, you know, we're in we're in summer camp. But as, as Tom knows, in, in, in Illinois, they call it camp, but it's really practice. So. <laughs> Uh, begin some good work in, uh, you know, the season's right around the corner for high school as well. So it's always fun to be out there on the field mentoring and, and coaching, you know, our young our young kids into men. Um, I have the opportunity to have Olin Kruitz on my staff as well as Rasheed Davis. So it's like being all in the locker room again. And, you know, it's a great opportunity and a blessing to have those guys with me, uh, you know, leading our team. Jason, when you get a chance to talk to the kids at this time of the year, do they, do they understand the experiences that you guys have had in your football life to um, really to take everything that you guys are telling them is, is an, it's a example of experience, not just, you know, coach speak in, in some parts. Yeah, they do. They ask us a lot of questions and that's a lot of, they ask us a lot of questions about life. You know, they, they ask us football questions, but they ask us about life. Like, you know, what did it take for you to, to get to the NFL? What type of sacrifices did you make? Uh, what are some of the, uh, the things you did off the field to be successful in life and not just football? Um, so it, it's great to be around. And we have a lot of uh, a lot of smart kids that just happen to be good at football. So any any life lessons we can give them uh, through the game of football, you know, it's a great opportunity for us to give back and help, you know, further their their careers, whether they, they play in college, in NFL, or where they want to, you know, get a job in Wall Street to become doctors. You know, that's our job is to is to be great teachers, be great mentors. Because I feel like if we only if we only help them become great football players, we fail as a coach, as a mentor. You know, we're trying to help them become great men. Yeah, that's a great stuff. But I I am curious, Coach, how how you structure your practices, and I'll give you an example. When I agreed mm-hmm. to attend Michigan State, George Perlis was a defensive coordinator who came from the Pittsburgh Steelers. We did everything like the Pittsburgh Steelers from the 70s. From the, Our uniforms were the same. We only had the emblem on one side of the helmet. <laughs> we practiced like them. And I got to believe you structure these like pro practices, which is probably great uh, for these young men. Yeah, you probably still have some nuances that you do differently, but, you know, the, these guys are learning probably to practice in, in the right way is my point. Yeah, 100%. You know, our practice is, is structured similar to the way that we, we had practiced. So, you know, it's up-tempo, not a lot of wasted time. We're moving from uh, drill to drill, uh, from period to period. Um, we actually, the thing that I did change, uh, we do our conditioning before practice. So that's the first thing we do. Uh, we do conditioning because I want our guys to be tired as we're going into different drills and different periods in practice. And then we also, our first phase that we start off with is special teams because you know, obviously when we played, special teams was a big phase, a big important part of our game. And I want our kids to understand that special teams is, you know, one of the most, most important phases of the game. So those are those are a couple uh, different changes that I made in terms of the way we practice, uh, you know, in Chicago. But everything else is structured in a similar fashion. 
All right, let, let me ask you this, Jason. So you ha- when you're a coach, you have your eyes all over the football field. When you're a football mm-hmm. player, you have your eyes on a specific area, whatever drill you're involved in. So now you're going to be doing the sideline reporting for the Chicago Bears games. I, I, w- I would imagine, does, does the eyes that you use as a coach going to benefit you for what you're watching on the whole football field while you're doing the, the sideline reporting? Yeah, 100%. Uh, obviously, being around the game as a player, um, I think that helps you, you know, transition into a coach. Uh, but that doesn't make you a great coach. There's a lot of things that go into coaching, especially at the high school level, that, that you cannot be prepared for as a player. Uh, for example, you know, when I first started coaching, the biggest adjustment I had to make was, hey, I've got to order helmets. I've got to send helmets and shoulder pads in for reconditioning and things like that. I've got to now order footballs. And when we play, we always had footballs in abundance, but now – I have to work with a budget to order football. So in terms of, you know, me being a coach and seeing the game uh, through the eyes of a coach now, it's going to help me um, hopefully give the viewers an in-depth, a more of an in-depth look as opposed to just a general sideline report where you're just reporting, you know, certain things that you have to report, report in terms of injuries and things like that. But I'll be able to give them little tidbits in terms of scheme and different things that I see, you know, the Bears doing or the opposing team doing it, uh, doing and just being able to, to translate that in the way to where the listeners can understand it. And, you know, I've, I've been working on my craft just like a, a coach would. Um, I, I've got a tape recorder, and I probably have about 10 made-up sideline reports on there already. So, you know, my, my wife looks at me cra- looks, looks at me crazy and is like, what are you doing? Hey, I'm doing a sideline report. i got to practice uh, to make sure that, you know, I, I'm contributing to the team. You know, i got two great teammates now. Obviously, Tom and Jeff, you guys have been doing this for a long time. Uh, you're great at what you do, and, and I'm, I'm the newest member. I'm the rookie. You know, I'm the rookie on the team, so I want to make sure I uh, hold up my weight. Well, let's talk about the, the uh, your eyes as a football player, because much like don't take the foot out of the football, don't take fullback out of football. Half right, these teams, right. Jason, don't have fullbacks <laughs> lining up. What the hell's going on? I mean, thankfully the Bears still do, but half the league really doesn't even have a fullback right now. What's going on? Yeah, I mean, as we know, Jim, it's a different game. It's 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 you know, it's set up. It's an offensive game when you look at it. It's set up for you know high scoring games. I mean, you look at defensive backs; they can't even touch a receiver. Uh, you know, a lot of times you, you throw that ball deep as pass interference as spots out. So, you know, these offensive coordinators are trying to find more ways to take advantage. You know, of the rules that are in place that are really set up for the offense. So, you know, I'm just thankful that during my playing days, the fullback position was a necessity, especially here in Chicago. And, uh, you know, having the opportunity to, to block for those great running backs that you mentioned before I, before I came on air with you guys, you know, having a great running back room, the Thomas Jones, the Matt Fortes, the Cedric Vincent, the Adrian Petersons, you know, and then to go along with the great offensive line that we had. It, it was th- Those were the good old days. So, you know, I'm just thrilled that I was a part, you know, of, uh, of a period in time in which the fullback was a position of value. You know, Jason, you're a you're a high school coach. You're going to be working the sidelines in the NFL game. And you have to kind of pay attention to all the stories around the league. So when you think about Ezekiel Elliott and Dalvin Cook and some of the other running backs that haven't signed yet or, or got an, an agreement, are you kind of surprised where the running back position is? Because I, I, too, I grew up as a fan of the fullback. It's a major part of my high school offense and when I was in college. But then you start – reading some of the stories around the league of where some of these guys could end up. Are you surprised there's so much conversation about the running back position um, in terms of some of these guys going forward? Yeah, I am. It is surprising when you look at uh, the talent that's still available and, you know, you look at Ezekiel Elliott and I know he's, you know, in his later years, but you look at Dalvin Cook, who I think is still one of the better running backs in the, in the league. And, uh, you know, even Saquon is still fighting to get a new Correct. deal up there, yeah, up there in New York. You know, it's surprising that the position has been devalued the way it has been. But I think in terms of if you look at it, with the success that a lot of running backs have had coming into the league as rookies, even if they weren't a, a you know a first or second round draft pick, you know later rounds guys that had success in this league. You look at Damian Pierce down there at Houston; he had a big year. Uh, I think that's why you know, a lot of GMs and a lot of teams are devaluing it because they say, you know what, if we can find a back that fits our scheme, he can be productive. And I think that's what these teams are doing now. They're saying, hey, we don't need to invest a ton of money, you know, in, in, in a lead back for an older guy when we can get a rookie, uh, get him in on a rookie deal, and he can still have the same success if he fits our scheme. 
Joined by Jason McKee, former fullback of the Chicago Bears, uh, ESPN 1000 Bears Weekly. And, and Jason, it's kind of it's, – it's oddly strange because here your, your quarterback is your number one investment, and you're right. I mean, they're actually – you got quarterbacks taking carries – away from quality running backs right now. I mean, here Justin Fields goes over a uh, thousand yards rushing. You got talented players like Lamar Jackson. You got Josh Allen, dude. That guy's got not scared of anybody. He's running over linebackers and taking carries away from uh, their running backs. And it just it just seems backwards that you that you put your quarterback like a Jalen Hurts in position to get hurt when you would think they wouldn't want to run them as much as they are right now because they're taking carries away from quality running backs. Did we lose Jason? No. Oh, we might have. I think we lost Jason. We'll try and get connected. But do you find that odd, uh, uh, Tom, because, you do, I, you know, I know who was it, even Andrew Luck, because uh, I talked to Frank Reich, and he was like, hey, this guy was running so much, which kind of led to his early retirement. And he's not a small guy, Tom. I mean, Andrew Luck was legit 6'5", 250 pounds. And, yeah, uh, you know, you, you know, one thing about it, Jim, is you you look at the – just the upgrade and the talent that you play against, no matter what position that you're going to play throughout your NFL career. If you think that you're a quarterback that has great escape ability, i.e. RG3, you're going to have great escape ability until someone gets in your way. And then you're going to feel that type of punishment. And if you feel it repeatedly, it's going to take a toll on your career in the long run. And I remember not to not to hash a uh, Michigan state product, but I remember looking at Tony Mandarich when he was coming out because I was in the NFL at the time. And I, we were thinking, Oh my God, this guy is going to come in here and he's going to create a whole new picture of what an offensive lineman is. And Dick Stanfield used to tease us about that. But then you're not playing against 215 pound defensive ends from Iowa. You're playing against guys like Julius Peppers and such that are such great athletes that, if you don't increase your style, your ability, your physicality of what you're going to bring to the NFL, it's going to take a toll on you no matter what position you play. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, and again, as much as you try to teach these quarterbacks, hey, you got to protect yourself. I mean, Lamar Jackson, who just got a big deal, he hasn't finished the last two years, which has affected the back end of their season uh, for the Baltimore Ravens. So I'm interested to see how Todd Monken the new offensive coordinator there for Baltimore really deploys him and gets him involved uh, in in the running game and how that offense is structured. Certainly Justin Fields got uh, banged up a little bit with the quarterback designed run. So yeah, you still want to mix him in, but you still have to, you know, make sure that the quarterbacks are, are taking care of himself, but it does seem to be more running back by committee and running backs, as you mentioned, Tom, have been in the news and there was news came out today. I don't think both either Josh Jacobs of the Las Vegas Raiders or Saquon Barkley, I, I doubt they report for training camp for either of those teams. They will not sign their franchise tags. And realistically, would they even play in the preseason games? Would they subject to those guys to getting injured? I doubt it, I bet you, but I bet you they show up and they'll be in there for week one for those respective clubs. Your thoughts? You know, Josh Jacobs – I, I'm, I still think the jury is still out on him a little bit because of some of the turmoil that he's faced with the Las Vegas team, the restructuring of the coaching staff, the quarterback position and everything. You think of Saquon Barkley, and here's a guy that has an amazing recovery from an injury. He has not skipped a beat. They have uh, videos of him squatting almost 600 pounds for reps. And here's a guy, if you want anybody that's a great example of dedication and leadership inside your locker room, this is what you're paying him for as much of his skills and his ability. You look at the analytics of the numbers with Daniel Jones, with Saquon in the game and Saquon not in the game and the, and the differences of it. And you just paid him an enormous salary, the quarterback position, to be the quarterback they want him to be when Saquon's on the field. So, um, you know, I, I pull for these guys that have shown what a model citizen they are in terms of speaking in football terms. And um, I, I think for what he's, um, what he's dedicated himself, that he deserves uh, the, the money that he wants and he's asking for. And I think ultimately uh, Dayball, the, the head coach up there at the Giants, you're a better team with a Barkley on it than if you're going to get a disgruntled Barkley that is going to have to make some business decisions along the way 
to make sure that he's fit and ready for whichever team he goes to if it's not the Giants long term. Yeah, and it, the, unfortunately, the market has plummeted since when the Giants gave that offer. Of basically, it was a two-year, $26 million deal uh, for, for Saquon Barkley. And leading up to, to training camp, certainly the frustration of both camps uh, now suggesting that they won't show up, uh, that the market is just not there. And I don't think those teams are going to budge, but I don't think they're going to hold out till week 10, which they have every right to do. Uh, but I doubt that they do, as they both will be playing under the franchise tag once they sign it uh, for their respective teams. Well, let's hit the last break here because, as promised, Tom, when we come back, we are going to get into that conversation of Braxton Jones, his thoughts on uh, first-year offensive tackle at the right uh, tackle spot. Uh, Darnell Wright will get into that conversation. So keep it right here on Bears Weekly, ESPN 1000. This is Bears Weekly with the voice of the Bears for 23 years, Jeff Joniak on the Bears Radio Network. All right, this segment of Bears Weekly is brought to you by Athletico Physical Therapy. Visit athletico.com to request an in-clinic or virtual appointment and start feeling better tomorrow. Yes, Jeff Joniak on vacation. He will be back with us next week. Next Thursday, we'll have Bears Weekly prior to the Bears reporting uh, to training camp. But uh, one of the in the news cycle that came out this week were really comments from Bears left tackle uh, Braxton Jones and really was commenting on on the right tackle, the top draft pick. When you look at uh, uh, Darnell Wright and Darnell Wright comes from a pass-happy offense, right? That's Josh Heupel as the head coach down there for the Tennessee Volunteers. And really, Braxton Jones went so far as that he's added some of the techniques that Darnell Wright used in college into his game uh, through the OTAs and in the, the minicamp. So, Tom, I really just want to get into that. I don't know how much you've seen of the techniques of Darnell Wright, but it, it, is, it was a pass-happy offense. They had Hendon Hooker, certainly very talented quarterback, who the Detroit Lions, uh, selected in this past year's draft for, but as big as a man that Darnell Wright is in terms of his kick steps and his movement ability and, and Braxton Jones, we know he's a, a really good athlete as he heads in uh, to year two and areas of concern where he needs to get better. Wanted to hear your comments uh, on what you thought about what Braxton Jones uh, had said to the media. You know, Braxton Jones, he lives in reality. He understands what he's saying, and what he says, if you listen to it, it has a powerful meaning about what you need to do as a football player, how you want to develop to get better, and how you want to improve your specific craft. And when you look at a guy that's about 3'10 in Braxton Jones, and then you have another guy in Darnell Wright that's about 335, there's a lot more absorption power in Darnell Wright than there is in Braxton Jones just because of his physical size and his upper body strength. And you think about the practice reps that Darnell Wright got against guys that in the SEC that he where he went to college and how good some of those players were. And then when you think of Braxton Jones at Southern Utah, you know, there was a difference in the quality of talent. So just the everyday work ethic that Darnell Wright had to improve on to make sure that he could hold up his end of the bargain just in practice, and then you got to carry that out into the games. So I think Braxton Jones, since the beginning that he's been here, he talks about his power, his ability to stop the bull rush, his ability to make sure that he can strike more powerfully with his hands. Those are all the things that I've seen out of Darnell Wright so far, and he kind of it reminds me of those offensive tackles that have that super huge, powerful upper body where they can absorb a bull rush and almost absorb it and stop it and then create that stalemate that you need. And I think that as much as Braxton Jones wants to be Darnell Wright, he's not going to be Darnell Wright. He's a different type of body at each side of, of the offensive line. And it's similar when you look at what Jimbo Covert was when he came in and where Keith Van Horn was. You know, Keith was 6'7", 265 to 280 pounds throughout his career. And Jimbo was more of a thicker, upper body, powerful guy like like Darnell. And so, you know, there are, I mean, you could want to match up to the similarities in terms of, you know, efficiently coming out of your stance, making sure you're getting set up your proper placement across from the defensive lineman that you have to block, whether he's inside shade, head up, 
or to your outside shoulder. And there are, are uh, the mechanical things that he can improve upon. But a lot of the mechanical improvements is going to be is going to come from Chris Morgan, the offensive line coach. And he's kind of similar to a pitching coach. Because every single pitcher is different. There's no two guys that are exactly the same. Their approach at the mound, how they deliver the ball, and what is their strengths. And when you think about an offensive line coach, there's a lot of similarities in that. Every single offensive lineman is a little bit different than the guy next to him. So that offensive line coach has to coach the best. Yeah, and that'll have to do it. We need to thank Jack Sanborn, Jason McKee, who join us, producers uh, Kendra Smith and Sean McGraney. Hey, we'll be back next week for Bears Weekly right here on ESPN 1000. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for listening to the Chicago Bears Network presentation of Bears Weekly, hosted by the mayor of Bearsville, Jeff Juniak, and Surfmaster Tom Thayer. Podcasts are available on the Chicago Bears official app. Brought to you by Verizon and Apple Podcasts. Bears Weekly has been brought to you by Ben Rivers and Miller Lite.